Hare Krishna. My humble obeisances, all glories to Srila Prabhupada. Okay, we'll begin. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Guru. Recording in progress. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschachadesha Tarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhaihevacha Patitanam Pavanibhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So welcome everyone to our ongoing study of Bhakti Shastri and we're studying Bhagavad Gita. This is uh, the first six chapters we're looking at. I'll share the screen with you for the slideshow. Are you able to see the slideshow? Yes, Maharaj. Good. Okay. Okay. We're going to go into this. The Yoga Ladder and Gyan in the Bhagavad Gita, Jnana Chakshush. All right. The vision of knowledge. So. We're looking at Niskam Karma Yoga, as it is described in the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 4, slokas 19 to 24, and chapter 5, slokas 7 up to 11. Right, We're, we've quoted one verse here, the verse number 19. Someone can read for us? Yes, Divyanga Mataji. Mataji, you are mute. Oh, sorry. Hare Krishna. Yes, you serve a samaramba, Pama Sankal Pavarjita, Nyana Kneeda Buddha, Karmana, Pahu Pandita Buddha. One is understood to be in full knowledge whose every endeavor is devoid of desire for self activation. He is set by sages to be a for whom the reactions of birth have been turned up by desire of public knowledge. There's something wrong with your mic, Mataji. Your voice was very unclear. Hare Krishna? Is it now clear, Prabhu Maharaj? Yes, much better. All right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can right. I repeat? No, it's okay. We can read it for ourselves. All right. So uh, we're hearing how the, 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 the effect of the fire of perfect knowledge burned up the reactions of work. So what is that perfect knowledge? Yes. Knowledge is understanding the self and the super, super self and the relation between self and the super self. Yes, right. Right. That's the fire of perfect knowledge. Understanding the position, the constitutional position of the living entity in relation to the Supreme Lord. 
So when we have that perfect knowledge, then the, the work, the reactions of the work are burned up due to the perfect knowledge. Of course, it's also mentioned here, his every endeavor is devoid of desire for sense gratification. So Niskan Karma Yoga is described like this, that he's considered to be in full knowledge because he has no desire for sense gratification. In other words, he's understood his identity as a spiritual being and he's understood his relationship with the Supreme Lord. In this way, he's able to detach himself from the results and, he's, and he doesn't have to worry about reactions from work either. Okay. Then text number 20 continues. Someone please read. Krishna Guru Maharaj. Tyaktva karma phala sangam nitya dritto nirashraya. Abandoning all attachment to the results of his activities, ever satisfied and independent. The Gita 4.20. So kindly note here that this kind of description does not really fit a devotee ever satisfied and independent. This, you can see the problem with karma yoga, how karma yoga, if it's not carefully controlled and if we're not carefully guided, by a bona fide spiritual teacher, then it can easily lead to impersonalism. This is the danger. When we showed the, the yoga ladder in previous classes, we showed how some people from karma yoga go to the impersonal Brahman. So these verses, which are describing Niskam karma yoga, they could also lead to that if we're not properly directed by the bona fide spiritual teacher. A devotee shouldn't be ever satisfied and he shouldn't be independent. One who is in Krishna consciousness doesn't want to cultivate these kind of qualities. Is that clear to everyone? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, yes Maharaj. Abandoning, even abandoning all attachment to the results of his activities. The devotee wants to offer the results of his activities to Krishna. Devotee wants to give the best to Krishna. We should, we can't just say, oh, don't be attached. Oh, don't be attached, Prabhu. Why should we be attached? Oh, we, we are, we should be attached to pleasing Krishna, to offering the best to Krishna. This should be the mood of devotee. So we have to be careful all right, and then go ahead. Next one, someone read. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Shari Ramke Varam Karma Kodarma Kebasam acts only for the bare, bare necessities of life. Thus, working, he is not affected by sinful reactions. Right. So again, you can see the impersonalistic mood, the bare necessities of life. That is not exactly the mood 
of devotee. We want to offer the most to Krishna. We're not concerned with the bare necessities of life. We want to offer everything to Krishna. We want to offer the best to Krishna. But this kind of, uh, reading these kind of words, these kind of statements, and if you take to the impersonal path, and the result is simply the heart becomes harder. Devotional service is meant, the heart is meant to melt. We're meant to feel more the loving exchange with Krishna. It's personal philosophy is very different from impersonalism. So it's very important that we understand these verses when we're properly guided by the spiritual teacher, like Srila Prabhupada. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, can you repeat that statement, Maharaj? Acts only for the bare necessities of life. Because even devotee has a uh, means he has the desire to live in a simple life to give everything to Krishna. So uh, I didn't get how it is not uh, applied to the devotee or. Well, the point is that we don't offer the bare necessities to Krishna. We want to offer the best to Krishna. Mm -hmm. But for himself, he always, you know, uh, uh, keep himself in a very simple uh, atmosphere. Of course, for our own self, we minimize our own bodily demands. But it says, acts only for the bare necessities of life. We act for the pleasure of Krishna and for okay. the, sa the, the satisfaction of Krishna. Okay. And we want to offer the most to Krishna, the best to Krishna. Okay. That's all clear, Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Hare Krishna. It, is, it will be like somewhere I'm feeling like contradictory, like simple living, high thinking, where we understand that we have to live very a simple life, then how it is like, as Prabhu even asked the same, even I got confused with that. Yes, okay. Simple living, high thinking, of course that's for us. But still, when it comes to Krishna, do you want Krishna to live simply also? Oh. You think Krishna will become do you think Krishna needs to do austerity? No. You know, when, yeah. Lord, when Lord Chaitanya took sannyas, the devotees were heartbroken. They felt so bad to see Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu renounce and take sannyas. They, they, they didn't like it at all. And when we worship Lord Chaitanya, we worship him as a, in, in his householder life, we don't worship him as a sannyasi. So we have to understand how to properly worship Krishna. Yes. So the bare necessity, simple living, high thinking, that's very good for us. Certainly it will purify us. But you don't, you don't want to apply that to Krishna. And uh, Srila Sh Prabhupada, just like Srila Prabhupada, you know, devotees wanted to, you know, they want, like to glorify Prabhupada. You know, okay, simple living, high thinking, okay, Prabhupada's coming, okay, we'll get him a bicycle, you know, or he, he has, maybe he should walk, maybe he should take the bus when he comes from the airport, you know. Are you going to receive him like that? He's representative of Lord Krishna. And so are you going to simplify everything and tell him to accept only the bare, bare necessities of life? 
<coughs> when we when we are relating to the spiritual master, we see the spiritual master as the representative of Krishna. Yes. So he may accept, he may not accept, but it's our duty to offer. It's our duty to offer the best to Krishna. Not that we should think, oh, Krishna, no, we, Krishna, you have to do austerities. Krishna, you have to do some tapasya here. <laughs> no. no, we have to give the best to Krishna. Yes. Uh, Maharaj, uh, like in this regarding again, like a question has come up because like as uh, staying in, living in Middle East, I have seen many devotees like uh, now they are shifting to dham and they are changing their lifestyle into very simple lifestyle. Then means like I'm not able to understand like how we should exactly like uh, staying here or we have to live going in dham and stay reside simply. Uh, it, it, it is somewhere I'm feeling contradictory. Like means like both are like different. Well, of course, there is a difference between us and Krishna. We're not Krishna. Yes. And we cannot imitate Krishna. So we have to, we have to understand the difference between the Supreme Lord and his devotees. What is the rule for the devotees? That's not required for the Supreme Lord. Okay. So, of course, yeah, we minimize our bodily demands, we min min minimize our needs, uh, bare necessities of life, that's all right for us, but we, we, that's not our main focus of consciousness. That should come about naturally in the course of our devotion to Krishna. If you simply do this kind of austerity, bare necessities of life and so on, you simply make the heart harder. But what, what we want to, what we encourage devotees to do is to cultivate devotion to Krishna. Now if in the course of devoting yourself to Krishna that you forget about the demands of the body, then okay. But it's, it should not be artificial that we're forcing ourselves to minimize the demands of the body. Oh, we have to fast. Oh, yeah, we cannot do this, we cannot do that. No, it should all come about naturally by dint of our devotion to Krishna. All the good qualities come where there is devotion to Krishna. Yes. <coughs> so, Thank you. If we just simply, if our focus is simply, oh, this is maya, oh, this is maya, we have to minimize, we have to cut down, oh, there's too much sense gratification. That is, will just simply make the heart harder. And if there's no devotion, then we will fall down. Without devotion, we'll fall down from the platform of karma yoga. And I've seen it. I've seen many people like that. They're so austere, they're so renounced, and then after some time they've gone. They go away. They, have, they didn't have the devotion. So the focus is on devotion to Krishna, not just minimizing the demands of the body. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay. So, one more there. Yeah, Maharaj. Maharaj, two devotees have a question. I can raise the hands. Okay. Yeah, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, I just want to read. So, can I read? Yeah. Shariram kevalam karma kurvan apnoti kil bisham. Act only for 
the bare necessities of life thus working he is not affected by simple reactions yadacha labha santushto satisfied with gain which comes from his own effort bhagavad okay. gita chapter 4 21 thank you yes someone still has their hands up there's some questions there yes rashikesh prabhu Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, sorry, um, just for a new equipment. Uh, Maharaj, thank you for the explanation on, uh, sorry, I've got two equipment running at the same time. I'm just trying to close one of them. Uh, Maharaj, uh, can you hear me, Maharaj, Hare Krishna? Y yes, can hear you. Okay, go ahead. Wonderful. Maharaj, uh, my question, I'm, I'm equally confused with the way other devotees have been. And uh, thanks for the explanation on that verse 421 is more on Nishkam Karma Yogi and uh, uh, an impersonalist mood. Maharaj, I'm looking at the purport section in the last, uh, we can say, uh, five lines, which I want to re repeat here. It says, a Krishna conscious person fully engaged in self-realization has very little time to falsely possess any material object for maintaining the for maintaining body and soul he does not require unfair means of accumulating money he does not therefore become contaminated by such material sins he is free from all reactions now nirasir etc have been used in 330 as well and i just want to read the uh, uh, two lines from burjan prabhu's purport he says this verse speaks of a highly advanced, comma, perfected devotee who is constantly greedy for Krishna's service. He considers himself insignificant and gives no importance to anything outside that service. His qualities will be further described, which is 422, 423, etc. So Maharaj, on one side, we see an interpretation from the purport of Prabhupada as well, where he is talking or stressing that this is a quality of being Sariram Kevalam Karma, this is a quality of a Krishna conscious person. And Bhurijan Prabhu also says that this verse speaks of a highly advanced, perfected devotee. Uh, I am trying to understand how do we match up this interpretation against an impersonalist mood, please. Well, that, that's what we said, you have to be guided by the pure devotees. Without the guidance, as you said, you were reading the purport. We're reading the translations. When you read the purport, then you, it, the focus becomes very clear towards devotion to the Supreme Lord. But without reading the purport, you just simply hear bare necessities of life, uh, satisfied with gain comes of his own. There's no question. There's no thought of the Lord. There's no. There's no mood of devotion there. It's all just based on negation. No. No. Not this. Not that. And this is leading to impersonalism. So the the you have to have the purports. It's very important. Without the Vaishnava purports, then we can easily go astray. One devotee was reading, uh, what, what, I think Jani, Janani Vas Prabhu was saying, he said, when they were reading another Bhagavad Gita. And it was, uh, the, the verse, the translations were exactly the same as Prabhupada's translation. And we said, well, you know, his, his, this Bhagavad Gita is impersonal, but the translation was the same. And Prabhupada said, yes, but the purports are different. You need the Vaishnava purports to actually understand the real message of the Bhagavad Gita. To get the Vaishnava conclusions, you have to hear from a Vaishnava. You know, Burijan is saying, oh, this is the highest the highest level of devotion. This is the highest. But it can also be impersonalism. 
There is a tendency towards impersonalism there. So you have to be aware how important it is to take shelter of Prabhupada's purports. It's not enough to just read the verses and not go into the purports. We will go astray. We have to hear the purports. Otherwise, you'll never, we will never get the proper understanding. Right? Uh, Rishikesh Prabhu, you are not audible. Hare Krishna Maharaj, can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Oh, thank you. Maharaj, I'm just looking at the first two lines of this verse. Mera sir ya chittatma, takta sari parigraha. Mera sir, if we look at 330, it says, My sarvani karmani sanyasa dhyatma chitsa, nira sir narnova bhutva. Nirasir is meant to be a property, a characteristic of a perfected advanced. Because 330 is pure bhakti. 3.30 Bhagavad Gita is pure bhakti. And again, Nirasir has been used here in 421. And, 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 and I think 272 also. But just sticking to these two verses, which are 330 is confirmed, it's a pure bhakti. 421 uses the same characteristic, nirasir, which is actually attached to pure devotee. So I'm just I'm just trying to understand it clearly. Yes, some uh, uh, nishkam karma yogis could deviate towards the Brahma Jyoti platform, an impersonalist mood. But when we talk, but are they nirasir? Are they nirmama bhutva? Probably not. And again, the same characteristic is used here. So it tends to give a feel that this verse could be for a pure devotee. Please correct me, Maharaj. I'm not challenging. I'm just asking because this is the best time I can ask questions. Yes, well, it could, as you, as you read, Parijan Prabhu, he said this is for the, the, the topmost devotee, the highest devotee. So it could be like that. But it can also be taken the wrong way. Everything depends on the attitude. What are you looking for? What is the person looking for when they read the Bhagavad Gita? You know, if they want to go towards impersonalism, they can certainly find ways to pick it up, to pick it out from Bhagavad Gita, from the, from the Bhagavad Gita. You can certainly come up with a lot of impersonalistic ideas if you want, if that's what you're looking for. At the same time, if you want to get devotion, you can also get that. So what, it depends what you're looking for. But we have to point out to people that there is that danger. Many of us are coming from impersonalistic paths. We're influenced by impersonalism, impersonalistic thought. We read so many books of impersonalists before we became devotees. So we do have a lot of impersonalistic ideas with us. And Prabhupada knew that. And that's why he had his, when he wrote his uh, pranam mantra, that he said, nirvishesha shunyavadi paschyacha deshatarine. Because Prabhupada knew we have a lot of impersonalistic ideas. And so he's very aware of that. So he has to write his purports very powerfully. So Maharaj, look, yeah? so Maharaj, looking at Prabhupada's purport, looking at Prabhupada's purport and getting a clear understanding from, and as you said, rightly said, you know, people could easily go astray if, if someone, uh, if, if a higher entity does not teach us. And, and Prabhupada has given us, and you yourself, Maharaj, thank you, you are a Shiksha Guru. So if, if we look at Prabhupada's purport, then can we conclude that 421, this particular verse, is actually pertaining to a devotee? Yes, it can lead astray to anyone who does not want to read the purports properly, but knowing what Prabhupada is telling us, can we conclude that this is dealing with a pure devotee? 
Oh, yes, yes, why not? Hmm. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, any other questions? Okay. Uh, just, just last one, Maharaj. Sorry. Yeah? So, to understand whatever you said, means you uh, mentioned that devotee wants to give everything to Krishna but keep nothing for us. So, uh, as a, today is the Jain and Day appearance, so can we uh, take his uh, example for this explanation that he worked hard and gave everything to Prabhupada for his mission? And he keep, kept uh, nothing for himself. So, to understand your exp uh, whatever you explain. Yes, right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, definitely. You're saying who, who's appearance day? This appearance is Jayananda Prabhu. Oh, Jayananda Prabhu, right. Jayananda, yes. yes. He gave everything to Prabhupada. Yes. He's a nice example, very good example. And Prabhupada also considered him to be a very good example. Right, he gave every, everything. Yeah, because he also worked, uh, I heard that 14 hours he drove taxi and whatever he was earning, he was giving it to Prabhupada. Yes, right. He was the first person to give Prabhupada a large donation. He gave Prabhupada $5,000 in 1960s. It was a lot of money then. Yeah. And Prabhupada used that money to print the nectar of devotion. So Prabhupada was very appreciative of his efforts. At the same time, he was very humble. He never tried to get a lot of recognition for himself. So, yes, he gave everything for Krishna. And very nice that you bring up the nice example, Jayananda Prabhu. So he gave everything for the service of Krishna's pure devotee. Okay, so we'll go ahead. Right? Someone can read? Yes, Rishi The consummation is absolute and that which is offered is of the same spiritual nature. Bhagavad Gita 421-422. So everything which is offered, the consummation as well, the, the performer of the sacrifice, everything is spiritualized by offering everything to the service of the Lord. So this is karma yoga, right? All that you do, all that you eat, all that you offer, give away, do it as an offering to me. Okay, now we're going on to the fifth chapter. Here's similar verses here, also on karma yoga. Someone like to read? Eva kin kinjit karome ti yukta manyata tatka vita. A person in the divine consciousness, although engaged in seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, eating, moving about, sleeping, and breathing, always knows within himself that he actually does nothing at all. Bhagavad Gita 5.8 and 9. Mm. He actually does nothing at all. So is he doing, who's doing it? Only the senses are doing. But the living entity is aloof. So this is divine consciousness. So detachment from the activities. Although he's engaged in so many activities, he's detached from everything. Yes? Yes, someone can read? Yes, Ramani Pangyu 
ಬ್ರಹ್ಮಣ್ಯಾ ಕರ್ಮಿ ಸಂಗಮ್ ತ್ಯಕ್ತ್ವಾ ಕರೋತಿ ಪರ್ಫಾರ್ಮ್ಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಡ್ಯೂಟಿ ವಿತೌಟ್ ಅಟ್ಯಾಚ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಸರೆಂಡರಿಂಗ್ ದ ರಿಸಲ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಆನ್ ಟು ದಿ ಸುಪ್ರೀಂ ಶಾಂತಿ ಮಾಪ್ನೋತಿ ನೈಷ್ಟಿ ಕಿಂ ಅಟೈನ್ಸ್ ಅನ್ಅಡಲ್ಟರ್ ಪೀಸ್ ಭಗವದ್ಗೀತ ಫೈವ್ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಟೆನ್ ಟು ಟ್ವೆಲ್ all right performs his duty without attachment the devotees we want to be attached to krishna right we are attached to krishna of course surrendering the results unto the supreme so that's also a problem the supreme who is the supreme different people have different ideas about who is the supreme for some people shiva is the supreme for some brahma for some ganesh it's going to vary and so this is a problem with this kind of uh, karma yoga that it's it's a little bit it's a little vague you see so prabhupada always makes it very clear what is actually the focus what is the goal what do we want but if you hear like this you know anybody a new person reading this surrendering the results unto the supreme what's the supreme the supreme brahman it could be anything And then attains unadulterated peace so maybe the goal is just to get peace that's why they say om shanti 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 right we simply want peace is the goal of life to get peace no the goal of life is not peace rather a devotee he will he, he wants disturbance but the goal, his goal is to develop love for krishna chaitanya mahaprabhu said prem punarto mahan the goal of life is to develop love of god not unadulterated peace you just simply want peace of course there's a lot of people they speak about peace and the united nations and the colorful flags it's simply a colorful display of so many flags without any real peace we know how in the world there's so much conflict so many wars so here you can see a number of verses from these different sections of verses we've been studying right from prabhupada's purport would someone like to read for us yes puja mata Hare Krishna Maharaj can am I audible Yes Nitititto nirashaya This freedom from the bondage of actions is possible only in Krishna consciousness when one is doing everything for Krishna a Krishna conscious person acts out of pure love for the supreme personality of Godhead and therefore he has no attraction for the results of the action He is not even attached to the personal maintenance. For everything is left for Krishna. Yes. That's from the purport, chapter 4, text number 20. So you can see how Prabhupada expertly directs us to understand everything in relation to Krishna consciousness. Yeah, we're not attracted to the results. But... and we're not we're not concerned about our personal maintenance we leave everything to krishna the focus has to be towards krishna to develop krishna consciousness not just simply detachment from the world but attachment to krishna the positive aspect there's no question of detachment you have to be attached to something so be attached to krishna that's the solution all right someone else can read yes you want to 
Shariram Kevalam Karma. As a machine part requires oiling and cleaning for the maintenance, so a Krishna consciousness, conscious man maintains himself by his work, just to remain fit for action in the transcendental loving service of the Lord. He is therefore immune to all the reactions of his endeavors. Purport 4.21. All right. So Prabhupada's giving this example about the parts on the machine. So the, the parts on the machine have to be maintained. You have to oil them and clean them. In the same way, a devotee, we have to maintain ourselves just to remain fit for the service of Krishna. We do have to eat, we do have to sleep, we have to give some time to rest the body and to maintain the body, although we're not the body, but we use the body in the service to Krishna. And this way we're immune to the reactions of the endeavors. There's no reactions because we're endeavoring simply for the service of Krishna. The Krishna conscious man maintains himself for the service of Krishna. We take rest for the service of Krishna. And we're eating so that we can serve Krishna nicely. So Krishna consciousness is practical. The jnanis, the yogis, they, they talk about renunciation giving up everything. But the devotee, his process is just simply everything for Krishna. Do it for Krishna. Eat for Krishna. Sleep for Krishna. Even we can do mating for Krishna. To have Krishna conscious children. This is the special feature of bhakti yoga. That in Bhakti Yoga, we, we're not required to follow vows of strict celibacy, but we can be we can be in householder life, and we can produce children, and it's it, it's not against the Bhakti Mark path. It, it, in fact, the act of producing children, Krishna Himself said He becomes that act when it is according to religious principle. So everything in the service of Krishna and without karma, without reactions. This is the unique nature of bhakti yoga. Other yoga paths is all give, give up everything, stop everything. Yes? Yes, someone can read? Yes, Radha Shambhu. Brahma, Karma, Samadhina, the absolute truth covered by Maya is called Meta. Meta debated for the cause of the absolute truth against its spiritual quality. Krishna consciousness is the process of covering the illusory consciousness into Brahman or the Supreme. English, English probably then call it. A patient who is suffering from a disorder of the vows due to overindulgence in milk products is cured by another milk product, namely curds. The more the activities of the material world are performed in Krishna consciousness or for Vishnu only, the more atmosphere becomes spiritualized by complete absorption. 4.2 4.24 purport, right? Yes. Brahma Karma Samadhina. All right, so this is very interesting here, Prabhupada's purport, describing the absolute truth covered by Maya is called matter. So what we think of the material world is actually the absolute truth, but it's covered by Maya. But that same 
matter dovetailed for the cause of the absolute truth regains its spiritual quality. In other words, when we use the material energy for the service of Krishna, then it regains its spiritual quality. Everything is actually spiritual. Sarvam kalv idam brahma. Shankaracharya took that aphorism from the Vedas that everything is spirit. And we agree. But it becomes covered. It becomes covered by Maya. But when, when it is dovetailed for the cause of the Absolute Truth, then it regains its spiritual quality. So a devotee knows how to convert matter into spirit. Not difficult. We make matter into spirit simply by connecting the matter into the service of the Supreme Absolute Truth, Lord Sri Krishna. As soon as we use the, uh, the, the matter, the material energy in the service of Krishna, then it becomes spiritual. You know, you give me all your money, all of your money, it's spiritualized in the service of Krishna. Some people think about the material world, oh, we want to give it up. R remember there was the one sadhu in Bengal, he had a picture taken, he, he wouldn't touch any money. Money was on the table and he put his hands up like that. No, no, he didn't want to touch the money. Prabhupada said, they can take a picture of me counting the money. And he said, I will spend it all for Krishna. And so, our process is not negation. It's not that we want to give up everything, but rather we want to have, uh, have all the material energy spiritualized by using everything in the service of Lord Krishna. Just like you can see in the photograph, Prabhupada sitting in a nice car. So Prabhupada sitting in the nice car, that's using the car in the service of Krishna. Using the, 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 the car for Krishna's service is spiritual. It's not Maya. So we don't we're not afraid of the material energy, rather we want to convert the material energy into the spiritual energy by engaging everything in the service of Krishna. And so many nice buildings are, were there and when they came to the Krishna consciousness movement, then the Krishna consciousness movement would make them into nice temples. And they would become very heavenly, very, uh, very uh, pure and spiritual abodes, residencies. But previously, before Krishna consciousness, they were, they were useless, they were just vacant. And they were just simply used for so many mundane, uh, sensory activities. So we do want to convert everything to spirit and the, under the guidance of the pure devotees we know how to do it. And Prabhupada gives this example which is very well known in India of course. You eat too many milk sweets or milk products then you may get a stomach problem. And how to cure that stomach problem? Then you may have to take yogurt. If you take too many milk products, maybe too much uh, sweet rice or too much uh, hot milk, then you can cure the stomach problem by taking some yogurt or curds as it's called here. 
So the yogurt has an opposite effect from the milk product. The milk, hot milk, that heats the stomach, but the yogurt cools the stomach. So it solves the problem. So in the same way, matter used in the service of Krishna is good, but that matter used for our sense gratification is a big problem, very bad. So Prabhupada explains, the more we do Krishna conscious activities, the more the atmosphere becomes spiritualized. Okay, so this is Krishna conscious. Yes, someone read? Yes? Yes, Ramani Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yeah, go ahead. Keep reading. Uh, okay. A Krishna conscious person never thinks that I am doing something. Even if you ask him that, are you going to such and such place? He will say that, I do not know when I shall go. But when Krishna will ask me or allow me to go, I shall go. Mm, right. Keep reading. Keep reading. Surendra Prabhu? Yes, uh, I am saying this, uh, I am saying this from my practical experience uh, from my Guru Maharaj. Yes, what happened? I think we lost him, Ramaraj. His connection is... Uh, okay, someone else read. Yes, Mukesh Prabhu. I am saying this from a practical experience from my Guru Maharaj. He would never say, I am going, I am doing, no. If Krishna desires, then I shall do it. If Krishna desires, then I shall do it. Thank you, Prabhu. So that's Prabhupada's lecture, fifth chapter. Text 17 to 13 of Bhagavad Gita in 1966, New York. So Prabhupada pointing out how his spiritual master would talk. He would never say, I am going or I am doing. But he would say, if Krishna wants, if Krishna allows, then I shall do it. If Krishna gives me the, 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 the service, I will do. So this is a good attitude, we should develop this mood in relation to Krishna. He would not say that I shall go, but he said, if Krishna will allow me to go, I shall go to see everything in relation to Krishna. It's very important. It's a very uh, good consciousness which we want to develop. If Krishna allows me, we will do it. What is Krishna's plan? All right. Okay. Now how many people do we have here today? We have 42 Maharaj. 42. So can we make pairs and you can read 5.2 and purport and discuss significant statements? Yes, Sri Chapter 5, text number 2. And we'll hear what are the significant statements you picked up from this verse.
with us, Prabhu? Yeah, I'm setting up the breakout rooms. Just give me a moment. Yeah. Maharaj, could you uh, let us know how, how, how much duration we want to set for this discussion? Yeah, 10 minutes. Okay. Thanks, Maharaj. We are ready to open up the rooms.
Okay, <clears throat> so what parts of the purport do you think are particularly significant? I think the by mistake they have backed up as the as to you. What what are you saying, Prabhu? We uh, somehow I think uh, we've been put up in a room separate to with you rather than with other devotees. So the others are not back as yet. It's still two minutes for that. Oh no, uh, we we still have some time. I think I think because I heard that. We still have about four minutes. But the talk shows one and a half minutes. Anyway, so have you got picked out some significant points from the purport? Uh, yes, but I, I have. Which parts did you like, did you think were particularly significant? Yes, sir. This is in uh, para number four para. There in uh, specifically, it is clearly said that uh, action in Krishna consciousness automatically helps one escape the result of stupid action, so that one need not descend to the material platform. Therefore, action in Krishna consciousness is always superior to renunciation, which always entails a risk of falling. <coughs> This particular line, Maharaj, feels me that actually Krishna consciousness is actually superior than just mere renunciation. Renunciation without Krishna consciousness is incomplete. But I'll also say this. It's not easy to hear you, Prabhu. I don't know. You're, I think you, you... Do you have a microphone there? No. Okay, we're finishing now. Recording in progress. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, is everyone back now? Yes, yes, Mahārāj. Okay. All right, who would like to volunteer to share with us what they discussed? 
Yes, we will come on that. So we uh, discussed that based on 5.2. Uh, uh, there are a couple of points Prabhupada makes. First is he quotes from Bhagavatam and he says that uh, how the fruitive activities, uh, uh, vikarma, what, what we do is, is you know, useless because, because of the karma or fruitive activities, what we have been doing, uh, we are in this body. We will continue this cycle. Um, so... Uh, we have to develop dev devotional service to Vasudev, then only we can uh, get out of this bondage of material existence. Uh, at the same time, he says uh, that uh, if for devotional service, on only knowledge is not enough, like jnana is not enough for liberation because it is um, um, action is required for devotional service. So it will not purify our heart. With just by knowledge, it will not purify our heart. So we have to do some action. So, and then third point he makes uh, from Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, how to make that action in Krishna consciousness is that instead of renouncing, use everything in the service of Krishna. Um, so when we use everything in the service of Krishna, knowing that Krishna is the proprietor of everything, and that is the true uh, renunciation. That is the true uh, understanding. Not not leaving everything. So. Yes, right. I think those are all very valid points, Mataji. Very nice. <clears throat> Would someone else like to add any other points? Hare Krishna pranams Maharaj, everything belongs to Krishna, so everything must be used in the service of Krishna. Yes, right. We heard that from Maharaji. I think she covered that in her presentation. Yes. Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Maharaj, uh, we should not behave like Mayavadis who renounce everything, thinking that this is material, this is material, and uh, we should use everything in Krishna's service rather than because everything is Krishna's property. Yes, very good, we agree. Everything should be connected to the Absolute. It's all Krishna's property, we don't need to renounce anything. We just have to use it in the proper way for the pleasure of Krishna. Okay? Maharaj, there is a risk of fall down in renunciation. So there is no risk in Krishna consciousness. <laughs> we hope. But we see sometimes that people do fall down. We do there are rare chances, rare chances due to association and continuous hearing and if we are following, if someone is following then there are rare chances of falling down but in renunciation it, uh, due to there is no activity although uh, he has renounced, he is leading simple life and everything like a, like a yogi but still there are chances of falling down due to sense uh, engagements, they try to engage senses even then because soul is so active Yes, because they have no proper engagement, so they, they're sometimes drawn back into the material world and take up material activities. Okay, yes, that's a good point. Thank you, Mariji. Yes, any other people? Yes, Go on. Yeah, uh, one's life is considered as a, as a failure if we don't inquire into our real identity and we have to work for self gratification till the time we start and work on the real identity of us. We, we don't know what, what is this strategy? Could you say it again? Uh, one's life is considered a failure if in the lifetime he doesn't he or she doesn't inquire into the real identity. And if we don't inquire about uh, our real identity, we have to work for our sense gratification. And we uh, continue activities and we continue in this cycle. 
Okay, yes, right. Our life is a failure if we don't become Krishna conscious. What does a man profit if he gain the whole world but lose his eternal soul? Prabhupada would sometimes quote the biblical statement. So, the life is a failure if we're not becoming Krishna conscious. If we don't make spiritual progress. Yes? Any, any, yes, any other points which haven't been mentioned? Thank you, Mara. Uh, Mara, just a quick briefing on this one that I could figure out was, this verse is actually being spoken because Arjun has mentioned some confusion in his mind. Krishna meant something else between work and renunciation and Arjun has understood differently. Therefore, the important point that I could figure out in this verse is, that Krishna is trying to clarify that renunciation of work, renunciation of work, not renunciation from work. So renunciation of work is inferior than working in devotion. They both are good, but it is better. Now keeping in mind that this verse has been spoken for Arjun, who is a Kshatriya, who is meant to do his prescribed duties. So, therefore, he is being told, number one, renunciation of work, as one Mataji had recently just said, that uh, that is actually the, the work of someone who is very advanced, who is pure in their mind. Then they can do that kind of austerity and go in a forest with a mind control. But for people like us, or those who have got prescribed duties, Working in devotion is the method which purifies our heart and we can achieve the same goal. And the chances, of course, as Mataji mentioned, are less for us to fall down. Hare Krishna. Yes. So certainly, I, we spoke about something similar. We spoke about karma sannyas and karma yoga. We said working devotion is better than giving up work. So you, you're making that point again also, right? The, the, yes, the, the, it complies. The same, the same thing is being repeated from chapter 3 to chapter 4. Right. Of course, the question at the beginning of, each, of the third chapter and the fifth chapter are very similar. So, the, so see, when you say uh, renunciation from work and off work, what, what do you see the, what do you see the difference? Rishikesh, it's your, for you. Yes, Maharaj. Oh, sorry, Ma uh, Mataji, can you please repeat the question? Yeah, when you say, Prabhuji, renunciation from work and off work, what do you see as the difference, Prabhuji? No, renunciation of work means I will not do any work. That way I will not get any reactions to the karma. Any activities that I do, good or bad, Maharaj had explained in the previous, but any activities that we do, good in mode of goodness, passion of, or ignorance, all of them have got some reaction attached to us. And even if you are good, you still have to take a birth again so that you can exhaust the good karma that you have achieved. So some people say, I'll not do any work. I'll go to the jungle and say Om all the time, quietly, which means that you are renouncing yourself from all work so that you do not get any reactions from it. But if you look at the beginning of chapter 3 itself, it explains that if you have India, India, Indiani sam, uh, Samyamya, Manasaha, but if you have got mind dwelled on somewhere else, then you are called a Mithyachari. Therefore, you can attain that path of renunciation from work or renunciation of work by going to the jungle only if your mind is pure so that you do not become a Vithyachari. Yeah, but probably sometimes we see, right, that so here you mean that by after purifying we can go to jungle, right? But sometimes if we see that Bharat, go, Bharat if Maharaj... If you see that path, 
if you want to use that path, yes, you are right. Purification of mind is the first condition. Yeah. But still, this path is sometimes better. Uh, we can see Bharat Maharaj went to jungle. He was a uh, you know, kind of pure devotee, but he ended up uh, you know, having attachment for a deer, uh, right? So still, action in Krishna consciousness is in association is better, right, sometimes? Mataji, uh, that's what in chapter 3, it was explained that even Krishna, who has no work to do, there is nothing prescribed for him. He does it so that he can set an example. And yes, for people like us, definitely it is a requirement. The chances of slipping, Bharat Maharaj slipped. Yeah. We will definitely slip. Mm. Okay, Prabhuji, I would like to add one point, if you allow me, Hare Krishna. Uh, the, under the direction of the assignment of course, under the direction of the spiritual master, I think it is okay to go to the jungle. The spiritual master says that you go to the jungle, then you must go to the jungle. Prabhuji, that is absolutely correct because if you look at verse number three thirty of Bhagavad Gita. Arjuna is being told, go and fight. Now, ideally, go and fight is a prescribed duty, which means you are doing Nishkam Karma Yoga. This is your prescribed duty, do it. But the moment Krishna ordains it, Krishna says, this is my order, and you follow it, it becomes Bhakti. Take the example of Prabhupada. Prabhupada told one of his disciples, go and drive a taxi, Go and drive a taxi and bring the proceeds to run the ashram here. Driving a taxi on its own is Nishkama Karma Yoga, but the moment your spiritual master has ordained it, it becomes a Bhakti Yoga. Jai, yes. <laughs> With the blessings of the Guru, then it becomes Bhakti Yoga. Interesting. Of course, the spiritual master will never send us to the jungle. He may send you to, to the, 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 the jungle-like city to preach, but he won't send you into the jungle away from the people. He wants to send you to preach. Thank you, Maharaj, for I, I had this doubt. So, <laughs> will he send you to jungle or no? Because Association is important, right? I oh, mean, yes. <laughs> yeah. Because that's why Jad Bharat, that's why Bharat Maharaj got problems, because he didn't have association. But he wanted association. That's why he took the deer and began to associate with the deer. And, you know, we, we try to also renounce the world. We go away from the world. We end up renouncing. We, who do we associate with? We associate with our mobile phone and our computer and we go online and we associate, <laughs> we find other ways to associate. And so it, 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 we can't actually just go away from the world and go, give up all association. We do need association very much and that's what keeps us in Krishna consciousness, the proper association. Hmm. All right, we'll, let's see, where are we? We'll go ahead with this. Um, okay. We'll yes, Madhuji, you want to say something? Uh, yes, Maharaj, uh, I want to add up in that, that uh, even Arjuna uh, in 6.33, he refused to go for in renunciation. He says this is impractical. So, he understood very clearly. Yeah, he yeah. said he couldn't control his mind, right? Yes. Yeah, he said he couldn't. For him, that time it was so difficult. So now it is Kalyu, we are really fallen. So it is really not uh, recommended. Not possible for us, right? Not at all, right? Okay, we'll go ahead. Here's another section here. This is relating to Bhagavad Gita. Uh, 5.2, 5 5.2, 5 Faugu and Yukta Vairagya, Jnana, 
or knowledge that one is not this material body but spirit soul is not sufficient for liberation. One has to act in the status of spirit soul. All right, so this is from the, 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 the sloka we were just reading here. We must have noticed this statement, certainly an important point in the, in the purport, that just simply having knowledge that we're spirit soul, it's not enough. We have to know how to act as a spirit soul. And Prabhupada talks about this often, about how people, impersonalists, they've understood they're, they're, that they're not the body, they've understood that they're spirit soul, but they don't know how to act on the status of spirit soul. And for the impersonalists, they want to stop all activity. But they cannot do that for very long. But the nature of the soul is to be active. And if they try to stop activities, they'll run into difficulties and they'll come back again to the material world. And they will take up some kind of welfare activities or philanthropic activities, something on the material platform. Because they have no knowledge how to act on the status of spirit soul. Right? How would you act on the status of spirit soul? What are you going to do? Yes, someone can tell me. How does the spirit soul act? Yes, Sunanda. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, we, we, we can act uh, on the status of spirit, uh, spiritual platform uh, when we know that everything belongs to Krishna and everything should be utilized by Krishna. Uh, then we, we can, uh, you can utilize everything uh, on, for the satisfaction of Krishna and that is the protection of re renunciation. And uh, in this way, uh, we can act on the platform of the, platform of the spiritual uh, status. Well, that's a very philosophical statement. Could you give me some details that exactly how we can go about acting on the status of spirit soul, rather than just some philosophical understanding? All right, for Kali Yuga, it is uh, chant and be happy. Okay, you can do kirtan, right? We can do yes. Yes. We can do. You can, you can do kirtan, uh, you can do uh, cooking, you can do decoration, uh, you can do uh, 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 gathering uh, uh, for the uh, uh, gathering for the knowledge of Krishna. Uh, right. Uh, right. You want to arrange programs, spiritual yes. discourses, discourses, and chanting, and then distribution of prasadam distribution of spiritual literature. These are all acts for on the status of a spirit soul. Yes. Prabhupada did not like to see us engage in mundane activities. Uh, he was also concerned, he said, opening schools. He said if the schools are just mundane, just on the mundane platform, it's not good just some mundane education. We don't want to educate our children just with mundane knowledge. It's not useful. It's not going to solve the problem of life. We put our children into ordinary schools, mundane schools, mundane knowledge, and so many exams, and they have to study. It's just a waste of time, a waste of the life. But still people will spend so much money, you know, those of you who have children, you used to probably spend a, a, a good amount of your income for the education of your children, to give them mundane knowledge. And that mundane knowledge will keep them in the mundane world. So, this is a problem, 
even though we may be devotees, we don't always act on the status of spirit soul. Yes? Yes. Okay. Act activities performed in full knowledge strengthen one's advancement in real knowledge. So we, we do want to understand what we're doing. We want to have proper knowledge. It's important for us. We can may be doing the RT, we may be worshipping and chanting mantras and so on. We're offering the food and so on. But if we don't actually understand fully what we're doing, then it won't, it won't be so good. But if we actually understand what we're doing, then we can advance. So we do, we need to have that proper, no, proper understanding that the, the, the knowledge should be there. Not just mundane book knowledge, but actual realization of offering everything to Krishna and how to utilize everything in the service of Krishna. All right, someone can read that for, for us here. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, uh, this related to the before, I would like to add, like uh, the nature of spirit soul is like na uh, jivera swarupa krishnera nitya das. Yes. Uh, means like so the the uh, the spirit souls. Nature is to serve Krishna always in any way. Yes. This 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 I would like wanted to add, Maharaj. Okay, very yeah, good. Uh, yes, Maharaj. Without Krishna consciousness, mere, mere renunciation of fruitive activities does not actually purify the heart of a conditioned soul. Action in Krishna consciousness automatically helps one escape the result of fruitive actions so that one need not descend to the material platform. Therefore, the action in Krishna consciousness is always superior to renunciation, which always entails a risk of uh, falling. All right. Action in Krishna consciousness is always superior to renunciation. So action in Krishna consciousness means engaging everything in the service of Krishna. Just like here you can see Prabhupada. Prabhupada looks like he's in an airplane. So Prabhupada is using the airplane in the service of Krishna. He's going to spread Krishna consciousness. Somebody may give up and say, oh, this is, my, this is Maya going in the airplane, this is Maya, you should be renounced. And so what is their renunciation? Go and sit in the cave and chant. But how long can you do it? How long will you sit in the cave and chant? We'll simply become agitated and go back to the material world. So we need proper engagement for our, uh, for our soul and we have to be properly situated. We have to find activities which actually nourish us and enliven us so that we can continue in our path of service to Krishna. So without Krishna consciousness, just renouncing activities doesn't purify us. Prabhupada said, he said, the man may say, I will not see any beautiful woman. I will go to Himalayas. I will not see the beautiful ladies. But <laughs> is that going to purify the heart? Within the mind he's thinking, beautiful ladies. <laughs> But the devotee, he will go and distribute books to everyone. And if he meets the beautiful ladies, he will sell them a book also. 
and engage them in Krishna consciousness. So that, that is much better than just simply trying to go away from the world. So two kinds of renunciation, falgo and yukta vairagya, right? Yukta vairagya means utilizing everything in the service of Krishna. And falgo vairagya, false renunciation. Oh, I will not touch any money. Well, we'll take the money and build a nice temple for Krishna. Or we'll take the money and distribute prasadam, distribute books. And then somebody, oh no, money's maya, I won't touch it. So what's better? Obviously better, you take the money and use it for Krishna. So many people have appreciated this. Yes? Someone keep reading? Yes, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Understand that factually nothing belongs to anyone. Then where is the question of renunciation? One who knows that everything is Krishna's property is always situated in renunciation. Since everything belongs to Krishna, everything should be employed in the service of Krishna. This perfect form of action in Krishna consciousness is far better than any amount of artificial renunciation by a sannyasi of the Mayavadi school. Thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Now, the, the Mayavadi sannyasis, they have renounced the world. They, they say the world is Maya. The Brahman Satyam Jagat Nitya. Right? The jagat is mitya, it's all false. So they renounce it, they go away from the world. Only the Brahman is true. But the devotees, we say that the world may be material, it may be temporary, but it's real and we want to use it. So in Krishna consciousness, one, will, one t may renounce in Krishna consciousness one may renounce by utilizing everything in the service of Krishna. Not that we give up everything, but we utilize it for the service of Krishna. So that is actual renunciation, properly utilizing everything, Krishna's property. And recognizing it is Krishna's property, we use it for the service of Krishna. So that is renunciation. So two kinds of renunciation. So this is far better. Yukta Vairakya, utilizing Krishna's property for the pleasure of Krishna. Now we're going to speak about the cause of suffering. We often wonder, why am I suffering? Why did Krishna do this to me? We hear people sometimes say, why did Krishna let this happen to me? Why am I suffering? I didn't do anything to deserve this. There, there was a famous book which came out many years ago now in the West. It was uh, published by a Jewish rabbi. And the book was called, Why Bad Things Happen to Good People. Now this, this Jewish rabbi, he was a married man and somehow his wife gave birth to a child who had a terrible disease. The child had a terrible disease in which the child aged very quickly, very, very quickly, became old very quickly. And so, it was very painful for the parents to have to see their child age like that. And the, the rabbi naturally wondered how this could happen to him because being a religious person and being the rabbi in the Jewish uh, synagogue, he, want, he, he was thinking why this happened to him. So he wrote a book about why bad things happen to good people. 
so we should understand, you know, generally we think that I'm a good person. Most of us think, I'm a good person. I didn't do anything. Did <laughs> we have this kind of uh, attitude, this kind of understanding that I, I'm only, I'm a good person. <laughs> and when something bad happens to us, then we wonder why it happens. All right, so we, we want to understand the cause of suffering. So first of all, begin with a quote here from the Vedanta Sutra. The Lord neither hates nor likes anyone, though he appears to. Well, certainly it's true. He, it certainly appears that he does like some people and he does dislike other people. Is it actually like that? Well, <laughs> According to Vedanta Sutra, it said, no, it's not actually like that. Let's see, here's from Bhagavad Gita. Oh, well, we don't have time to do this, but uh, we're not going to do drawings now. But who is responsible for the suffering of the living entities with reference to Sanskrit verses? Uh, we're particularly interested in the fourth and fifth chapter. Let's leave out the 13th chapter just now, because that will come up later when you study the, the, the latter half, of, latter section of the Bhagavad Gita. But 414, right? Would someone like to read the verse for us? Yes, Allah Prabhu. And Krishna Maharaj. Namam karmani limpanti, name karma phales praha, iti mam yo bijanati, karma birna sabadiate. Translation There is no work that affects me, nor do I aspire for the fruits of action. One who understands this truth about me also does not become entangled in the fruitive reactions of work. Hare Krishna. Read the purple. Right, Maharaj. As there are constitutional laws in the material world stating that the king can do no wrong or that the king is not subject to the state laws, similarly the Lord, although he is the creator of this material world, is not affected by the activities of the material world. He creates and remains aloof from the creation, whereas the living entities are entangled in the fruitive results of material activities because of their propensity for lording it over material resources. The proprietor of an establishment is not responsible for the right and wrong activities of the workers, but the workers are themselves responsible. The living entities are engaged in their respective activities of sense gratification, and these activities are not ordained by the Lord. For advancement of sense gratification, the living entities are engaged in the work of this world, and they aspire to heavenly happiness after death. The Lord, being full in himself, has no attraction for so-called heavenly happiness. The heavenly demigods are only his engaged servants. The proprietor never desires the low-grade happiness such as the workers may desire. He is aloof from the material actions and reactions. For example, the rains are not responsible for different types of vegetation that appear on the earth. Although, without such rains, there is no possibility of vegetative growth. Vedic Smriti confirms this fact as follows. Nimitta matram eva sao srija srijyanam sarga karmani pradhana karani bhuta yato vai srijya saktayaha. In the material creations, the Lord is only the supreme cause. The immediate cause is, the, is material nature by which the cosmic manifestation is made visible. The created beings are of many varieties, such as the demigods, human beings, and lower animals and all of them are subject to the reactions of their past good or bad activities. The Lord only gives them the proper facilities for such activities and the regulations of the modes of nature, but he is never responsible for their past and present activities. In the Vedanta Sutra uh, 2.1.34, it is confirmed, The Lord is never partial to any living entity. The living entity is responsible for his own acts. The Lord only gives him facilities through the agency of material nature, the external energy. Anyone who is fully conversant with all the intricacies of this law of karma 
or fruitive activities does not become affected by the results of his activities. In other words, the person who understands this transcendental nature of the Lord is an experienced man in Krishna consciousness, and thus he is never subjected to the laws of karma. One who does not know the transcendental nature of the Lord and who thinks that the activities of the Lord are aimed at fruitive results, as are the activities of the ordinary living entities, certainly becomes entangled himself in fruitive reactions. But one who knows the supreme truth is a liberated soul fixed in Krishna consciousness. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. All right. So, the, the, the purport, the, well, the verse is mainly speaking about the Lord that he's not subject to the reactions of material nature. But in the purport, Prabhupada does speak about the living entities. And how did he explain about the living entities? Yes? You all just heard the purport? What did Prabhupada explain about the position of the living entities, the cause of the suffering? Who is responsible? The living entity is responsible for his own acts. Yes, based on what? The Lord is only giving him facility through the agency of material nature. So it's his previous karmas, it's his desires which are giving him that body and the pain afterwards. Right, yes. This... Uh, Maharaj? Yes. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj? I have done one drawing related to this. Oh, really? You want to show us? Yeah. Yes, Maharaj, I'm showing what, just one minute, yes. What goes around comes around. So oh. whatever we do, that comes back to us. <laughs> okay, can we see that again? Just hold it up again. Okay. <laughs> Okay, what goes around comes around, eh? <laughs> In other words, the law of karma, right? Yes, Maharaj. Whatever we do, uh, whatever kind of work we do, we have the reaction of that. Even good work also has some reaction. And only inaction does not have, the work uh, which we do for Krishna does not have any reaction. Right. When we actually understand the position of the Lord, then there's no reactions. So there's three levels of working. There's the karma, vikarma, and akarma. All right, yes. And what about chapter 5, text 14 and 15? Would someone like to read for us number 14, chapter 5? Yes, Guruji. Yeah, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Nakatrutvam nakarmani lokasya shrijati prabhu nakarma phalasam yogam svabhavastu pravartate. Translation by Srila Prabhupada. The embodied spirit, master of the city of his body, does not create activities, nor does he induce people to act nor does he create the fruits of action. All this is enacted by the modes of material nature. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. The living entity, as will be explained in the seventh chapter, is one of the energies or natures of the Supreme Lord, but is distinct from matter, which is another nature called inferior of the Lord. Somehow the superior nature, the living entity, has been in contact with material nature since time immemorial. The temporary body or material dwelling place which he obtains is the cause of varieties of activities and their resultant reactions. Living in such a conditional atmosphere, one suffers the results of the activities of the body by identifying himself in ignorance with the body. It is ignorance acquired from time immemorial that is the cause of bodily suffering and distress. As soon as the living entity becomes aloof from the activities of the body, he becomes free from the reactions as well. As long as he is in the city of the body, he appears to be the master of it. But actually he is neither its proprietor or nor controller of its actions and reactions. He is simply in the midst 
of the material ocean struggling for existence. The waves of the ocean are tossing him and he has no control over them. His best solution is to get out of the water by transcendental Krishna consciousness. That alone will save him from all turmoil. Shall I continue reading, Maharaj? Yes, if you like, Prabhu. Yeah. So, 15th shloka. Nadyate kasya chit papam nachaiba sukrutim vibhu agnane navrutam gnanam te namohyante jantavaha. Translation by Srila Prabhupada. Nor does the Supreme Lord assume anyone's sinful or pious activities. Embodied beings, however, are bewildered because of the ignorance which covers their real knowledge. Purpose by Srila Prabhupada. The Sanskrit word Vibhu means the Supreme Lord, who is full of unlimited knowledge, riches, strength, fame, beauty and renunciation. He is always satisfied in himself, undisturbed by sinful or pious activities. He does not create a particular situation for any living entity. But the living entity, bewildered by ignorance, desires to be put into certain conditions of life and thereby his chain of action and reaction begins. A living entity is by superior nature full of knowledge. Nevertheless, he is prone to be influenced by ignorance due to his limited power. The Lord is omnipotent, but the living entity is not. The Lord is vibhu or omniscient. But the living entity is Anu or Atomic. Because he is a living soul, he has the capacity to desire by his free will. Such desire is fulfilled only by the omnipotent Lord. And so, when the living entity is bewildered in his desires, the Lord allows him to fulfill those desires. But the Lord is never responsible for the actions and reactions of the particular situation which may be desired. Being in a bewildered condition, therefore, the embodied soul identifies himself with the circumstantial material body and becomes subjected to the temporary misery and happiness of life. The Lord is the constant companion of the living entity as Paramatma or the super soul and therefore he can understand the desires of the individual soul as one can smell the flavor of a flower by being near it. Desire is a subtle form of conditioning for the living entity. The Lord fulfills his desire as he deserves. Man proposes and God disposes. The individual is not. Therefore, omnipotent in fulfilling his desires. The Lord, however, can fulfill all desires and the Lord being neutral to everyone does not interfere with the desires of the minute independent living entities. However, when one desires Krishna, the Lord takes special care and encourages one to desire in such a way that one can attain to him and be eternally happy. The Vedic hymns therefore declare, Esha hu hi eva sadhu karma karayati tam yam ye bhyo loke bhyo unnis nishthe esha yo eva sadhu. Shate, the Lord engages the living entity in pious activities so that he may be elevated. The Lord engages him in impious activities so that he may go to hell. Kaushitaki uh, Upanishad 3.8 Agno jantur anisho yam atmana sukha dukha yoho ishvara prerito gathet svargam vashva abhab abhrabam evacha the living entity is completely dependent in his distress and happiness. By the will of the Supreme, he can go to heaven or hell as a cloud is driven by the air. Therefore, the embodied soul by his immemorial desire to avoid Krishna consciousness causes his own bewilderment. Consequently, although he is constitutionally eternal, blissful and cognizant, due to the littleness of his existence, he forgets his constitutional position of service to the Lord and thus and is thus entrapped by nishans. 
and under the spell of ignorance the living entity claims that the lord is responsible for his conditional existence the vedanta sutras 2.1.34 also confirms this vaishamya naigrnyesna sapeksh sapeksh tatvat tatha hi darsh darshayati the lord neither hates nor likes anyone though he appears to thank you maharaj hari krishna thank you very much yes very nice here yeah. so we can see in these purports shrila prabhupada gives a lot of analogies as well as uh, sanskrit verses to support who is actually the cause of the suffering of the living entity particularly in the purports 14 and 15 what was the actual cause of the suffering of the living entity who remembers the actual Hare Krishna cause? Maharaj the living entity forgets his constitutional position of the service to the lord and thus in in trap in the innocence okay so forgetfulness of his constitutional position or we could simply say due to the ignorance of the living entity due to ignorance it's forgetful the cause of all of our suffering is due to ignorance because of ignorance we act in sinful ways and the sinful activities cause us suffering and keep us in the material world but the initial cause the foundation the root of all of our suffering is ignorance forgetfulness of the lord and conscious just simply uh, being conscious of the body, being absorbed in the bodily conception of life. So that is the cause of our suffering in the material world. And it's brought out in those verses, the cause of suffering. So we want to understand these points very carefully. Because we often have to present to people, people are suffering, how do you preach to them? You know, we get devotees sometimes, they get, they become devotees. We had one man, he took initiation and it was just a couple of months later, he was diagnosed with cancer. And so it was very great shock to him. You know, he thought, you know, I just took initiation and now I've got this cancer, how is it like this? So how would you respond to such a person? What would you say? Yes, you want to say? I had a question, but I, I I don't want to respond to this. I had raised my hand earlier. Well, your your a question. question has to wait. You know, you have to wait yes, for your yes, question, sir. Prabhu. Yes, Maharaj. Can someone give a response to my question? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Krishna Guru Maharaj. Uh, maybe we can tell um, that Prabhu that um, what whatever can, he's suffering from cancer because of his uh, previous because of his karma, so previous activities. So now he's suffering the reactions. Also, we could tell him that um, uh, he can view it. In, you know, he can view it that Krishna is being merciful to him and reducing his misery a lot. Um, if Krishna had not done that, he would suffer a lot more uh, problems and things like that. Is that okay, Maharaj? Well, I, I don't know about Krishna reducing his suffering. You, I mean, it seems like Krishna gave him suffering, right? He's got cancer, you know. <laughs> uh, you can't say, you know, Krishna is reducing your suffering. And it's a little difficult to convince him like that. Krishna? Yes. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, we can we can talk to him and say that uh, initiation has nothing to do with the bodily concept of your life. Initiation is of uh, your soul. So these things will come and go. But then uh, now, you, since you are initiated, you will have all the power and energy because your soul. Uh, Consciousness has uh, developed to overcome whatever you are going through in, a, in your bodily concept of life. 
Yes, that's uh, reasonable. Prabhupada speak that just because we're devotees, we shouldn't think we won't suffer. But when the suffering comes, we can tolerate it. And we can put up with it. And we can go on with our Krishna consciousness. We won't be, become overly affected one way or the other. The material miseries are going to be there, suffering is always there. But just because we're devotees, we shouldn't think that, oh, no more suffering. We just, we just accept it as Krishna's plan and then go on with Krishna's service. Ideally, that's how we should respond. The Krishna, just, Maharaj, yes? uh, Maharaj, can we also quote? Um, you know, the verse from Bhagavad Gita, Matras, Parasas, Tekonte, Sitoshna, Shepard, Rupada. Can we quote that verse to that um, Prabhu, saying that suffering will come and go, but, you know, a wise person will view it like the changing of seasons. He won't get affected. Yes, you could quote to him. I don't know how he will respond. I don't know, you know what kind of reaction we get from it. I don't know if he'll be in agreement or not, but certainly no harm to quote. His concern at the time, I remember now, his concern was, he said, you know, my friends know that I took initiation. They'll tell me that, see, your initiation didn't protect you. you know, what was the point of taking your initiation? It didn't protect you. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, so maybe we can tell him the bright side of things that look at the bright side you have been connected to the guru parampara and uh, your friends they might not be they, there is no gati of your friends because they are not connected to the guru parampara but you if you are ser serious and sincere in your effort then your spiritual master will take care of taking you back to godhead in this lifetime or the next okay yeah I'm assuming that if he got initiated, he must have some faith and then got initiated. Yes, must have had some faith to get initiation, right? To come up, come forward, to go through the initiation process and accept initiation. He must have had some faith. That faith may have been diminished, of course, knowing that he's got cancer. He may have lost some faith. <laughs> you know, it happens like that sometimes. You know, we get these we get some difficulty and we think, how could it happen like this to me? You know, I'm a devotee and why Krishna did this to me? Hmm? Anyway, uh, I think it's important for us to encourage people in these situations that we should understand that we're all going to suffer these things sooner or later. It comes to all of us. We all have to suffer old age and disease and death. It's there for everyone. And just because we're devotees doesn't mean that we won't have to uh, accept these things. Of course, they're there for everyone. And because we're devotees, and especially someone's initiated, then they should be strong enough to know what is actually happening. That is simply the change of body. The death is simply the change of body. We give up one body, we'll take a new body. We could say Krishna wants you to get a new body. He wants to take you to a better place. You know, why are you worrying? Krishna is taking you out of this place. He's going to take you to a better place. He's going to give you a better bo body. Krishna's got a better plan for you and he wants you to do some service some other place. That's why he's taking you out from here. So we could encourage him like that, that Krishna's plan has a better plan for you. And as far as his friends and those people go, that, that, that this is a good opportunity to preach to them. That, yes, I've got cancer, I know I'm going to die. And he said, but I'm not, you can explain, you're not really worried about it because you know what death is. You've understood death, you know you're a soul, you know the soul doesn't die, the body's only going to give up, but everyone gives up the body. The body's only the dress. So why lament for the dress? So he can preach to his friends. It's a very good platform for presenting Krishna consciousness. If we have that Krishna consciousness in that situation, we can give Krishna consciousness to others. 
and showing people how to deal with these things when they come up. We need to show the example. And that's what Prabhupada did. You can see Prabhupada's final lesson. We see Sukadeva Goswami and with Maharaj Parikshit, Maharaj Parikshit's final lesson, you know, seven days hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. Like that. So this is the business of devotees. And Gadvanga Maharaj only had a moment, but he could get success and go back to Godhead. So suffering is unavoidable, but we shouldn't lament, we shouldn't be worried so much about it. We have to transcend the suffering. Yeah, we are responsible. We could say it's all we're responsible. Tate nukampam sushamikshamana bunjana evatma kritam vipakam. The famous verse in Srimad Bhagavatam. The one who tolerates all difficulties which come as reactions due to his past states, but goes on engaging his body, mind and words in the service of the Supreme, then he's qualified to become my unalloyed devotee. So Krishna says, Nadaya Bhak, Tate Nukampam. Nadaya Bhak, right? He said, I take him back to Godhead. It becomes his rightful claim to go back to Godhead. You just, we just have to tolerate the difficulties and Krishna will deliver us out of this world. Maharaj, which verse is that? Tate no Kampam, Yeah. It's in the 10th canto, Brahma's prayers. Brahma's prayers okay. to Krishna after the Brahma Vimohan Leela. Mataji, it is in 10.14.8. Okay. okay, so here's a quote from Prabhupada. Your responsibility, just like a thief, he's praying to God, my dear Lord, give me some opportunity, I can steal that thing. Krishna first of all says, no, no, don't do it, but he insists. Then Krishna said, all right, do it. But as soon as you do it, you become entangled. Why you are doing against the will of Krishna? That is your entanglement. Krishna is giving you facility to steal others' property, but you become entangled. That is not Krishna's responsibility. Your responsibility. Right? We can't blame Krishna. It's our responsibility, not Krishna's responsibility. We were responsible. The thief was responsible. We wanted to do it. We insisted. And so we have to take the responsibility. He can give you permission, but the enjoyment and suffering will have to be taken by you. You insist permission. I want to do this. And without permission, you cannot do it. Therefore, Krishna gives you permission. All right, you do it, but at your risk. Krishna does not want that you should do it, but you want to do it. Therefore, he gives permission. This is Anumanta, right? Anumanta. In Bhagavad Gita, described the super soul as uh, Upadaksha and Anumanta. He's the overseer and the permitter. Upadrasta and Anumanta. He's the overseer and he's the permitter. So here, Anumanta, permitter, he's giving permission. Bhagavad Gita, 13th chapter, text 23, lecture in Bombay. All right, just to finish off what we covered here today, we explained how a jnani acts without encouraging reactions. The jnani doesn't get reactions. Remember the fire, burned up by the fire of perfect knowledge. The reactions to his work are burned up by the fire of perfect knowledge. 
So that was 1420, uh, Bhagavad Gita. So that, this is section four, chapter 4, text 19 to 24, and chapter 5, text 7 to 12. And there's other verses and analogies there, all dealing with how the jnani doesn't get reactions. When someone acts with knowledge, it doesn't get reactions. And then we talked about consequences of impersonalism resulting from the misapplication of the gyan, which was explained in those verses. That if people do become, if they take to the impersonal path, then because there's no bhakti, there's no devotion, they will fall down. They'll fall back to the material world again. They won't be able to remain on the transcendental platform. And then we spoke about falgo and yukta vairagya from Bhagavad Gita chapter 5, text 2 up to 6. Different kinds of what is actual renunciation and what is false renunciation. False renunciation. Giving things up. Oh no, this is no good. Don't touch it. It's maya. Money. Don't touch it. And the monkeys are very renounced. So we have to learn how to do, how to actually renounce means to use everything in relation to Krishna. So that is perfect renunciation. And then who was responsible for the suffering of the living entities? Fourth chapter 15, where? And chapter 5, text 14 and 15. Who is responsible? The living entity himself is responsible for the suffering. A final quote from Prabhupada from 13th chapter, text 22. The best example is here. Arjuna is hearing the signs of God from Krishna, the living entity. If he submits to this hearing process, will lose his long-cherished desire to dominate material nature. And gradually and proportionately, as he reduces his long desire to dominate, he comes to enjoy spiritual happiness. As he becomes learned in association with the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he proportionately relishes his eternal blissful life. All right? So, now we'll take questions, right? Some devotees have questions. Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Maharaj. So, uh, during the lecture, uh, point was mentioned that uh, Srila Prabhupada uh, uh, wasn't in favor that mundane knowledge be accumulated because obviously it's uh, not very adhering to Krishna consciousness. But also in the case of uh, His Holiness uh, Bhakti Swarup Damodar Maharaj, who was a scientist, and few of my friends who are also like working with spirituality and science, like bringing, bridging them together. So how to understand this, these things together and uh, whether efforts should be made in that direction or are they going to be futile? So that's one question. Yes, well, uh, Prabhupada did form the Bhaktivedanta Institute. The Bhaktivedanta Institute was meant for people who are actually trained in science and who have that kind of background and the educational qualifications to take up preaching in that field. And so Prabhupada certainly wanted it. He was very pleased when His Holiness Bhaktisvarup Namadar organized a conference and brought scientists together and to discuss about the nature of life and that life doesn't come from chemicals, but life comes from life. So Prabhupada definitely wanted this kind of preaching to go on. 
and uh, of course he wants it had, has to be done by the prop the proper people people with the proper educational qualifications that background that they can preach to other scientists yes ma'am artist from yes and Bhakti Swarup Dhammadhar Maharaj, and also there was the other devotee, Sadaputta Prabhu, or Richard Thompson, as he was called, his karmi name. He did a lot of work also, and he wrote some very, very interesting books and some videos also. They had difficulties to work together, that was the only problem. You know, they have different ways of dealing, and they were very different people, although they were both scientists. but they had different ideas about how they wanted to preach. But they both made very important contributions to develop the preaching in the scientific field. And Richard Thompson, Sadaputta Prabhu published books also, nice books. And they have also Druta Karma Prabhu who's also been doing some work and some related fields, archaeological cover-ups and so on like this. So different devotees certainly uh, they did a lot of work. Of course it's uh, not easy, it's not an easy preaching field. And you, they can, you know, the, the scientific world is such that if you come along with a different theory from what everyone else is preaching, you know, they don't like it. They'll hate you, they'll really attack you, and they'll really try to pull you down. And you know, this is what happens, you know, people like Druta Karma Prabhu, when he writes something about scientific cover-ups, you know, they really get very upset, you know. This, this is not what they want to hear at all. <laughs> so, it's really a difficult field to enter into. But certainly Prabhupada wants it, and that it, we hope it will go on and, you know, those people who have the right credentials that they can develop the preaching field more, holding scientific conferences. We had a conference in, uh, in Juhu before with a number of scientists coming from America, also different Nobel Prize win winners and so on. They all came to Juhu to attend a, a, a scientific conference. Even the Dalai Lama came one time. <laughs> they were able to get the Dalai Lama. He didn't know us at all. <laughs> you know, he'd never heard of Krishna consciousness. It was completely new to him, you know. But somehow he was able, he came along and he gave a talk. Hmm. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay, somebody else has questions, yes? Yes. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, uh, I, you told about uh, permitter, like uh, Krishna gives the permission, Anumanta, Anumati. Mm -hmm. So is there any word I missed out which is used for the jiva who desires? The jiva uh, who, who, who desires? Like Anumat, Anumanta is for Krishna, for yeah, giving, giving, I think permission. I missed out the An word. Which there's Upadrasta, Upadrasta. Upa and Anumanta, they're both together in the verse, they're both related to Krishna. Because Krishna is the overseer, the Upadrasta is the overseer, and the Anumanta means the permitter. So Prabhupada, we used Anumanta because he's talking about giving permission. Krishna gives permission to the living entity to do it, right? So, these, these words are from which verse, Maharaj? Uh, 15th chapter, I think it's text 13. Okay, thank you, thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yes, someone else has their hand up here? Maharaj, uh, this is Vidur speaking. Can I ask a question, Maharaj? Are you able to hear me clearly, Maharaj? Yeah, okay, Prabhu, yeah. Uh, Maharaj, <clears throat> just towards the end of the class, you said that living entity is in this material world uh, because of his false ego and because of his ignorance. And uh, but in chapter 5, verse number 15, toward, in the last paragraph, it is written that uh, due to the littleness of his existence, he forgets his constitutional position of service to the Lord and is thus entrapped by Nisais. 
So there are two things here, Maharaj. First, uh, as you said, that living entity is here due to his ignorance. And uh, uh, another point that comes up here is that the minuteness or the uh, uh, difference in magnitude of uh, the living entity as compared to the supreme that has also come into picture. So, Maharaj, uh, how to consolidate this? These two things. He, uh, the living entity, is here because of his uh, nisais or because of uh, the uh, insignificant size or ability of power of that living entity. How to consolidate these two? Yes, well, you could say they're both factors. Certainly, were insignificant. We are the we're compared to the, the sparks, right? The Lord is like the fire and the living entity is like a tiny spark which comes from the fire. So we have the qualities of the Lord but in different quantities. We have the qualities, qualitatively one, but quantitatively different. So just like the spark coming from the fire, the spark also has heat and light, but because it's very small, it can easily be extinguished. If the spark f falls into the water, it will be extinguished. Or if the spark falls onto the, the damp grass, it may be extinguished. But if the spark contacts dry grass, then it may make a fire, it may ignite and you may get another fire growing. So it depends a lot on the association, where the living entity is going to associate and who is going to be with. But we are very small, very minute. The Lord is Vibhu and we are Vibhanamsha. We are very small, we are the Amsha. He is the Vibhu, he is the great and we are the small very small. So, there's a difference there in dimension. At the same time also, because we are small, our knowledge is easily covered. We're easily influenced. The, as, as I said, the heat and light can be extinguished and the spark can lose its qualities due to the influence of the, the, the water or the damp ground it may extinguish the heat and light of the fire. The same way the living entity contacts the material nature and due to forgetfulness, he becomes covered by the material energy. The, the, the forget, so the forgetfulness becomes more prominent and we start to just identify with the body. We forget our spiritual position. We forget everything of our constitutional position. And we just th simply think of ourselves in terms of the material body. So you can see there's a connection with the dimension and the knowledge, the forgetfulness, that they're, they're related, that because we are small, then it's much easier for us to become covered and to become forgetful, to become forgetful. And then Yes, sir, I, I, I got the link between the two things. Okay. That's the beginning, that's our entanglement in the material world. All right. Any other questions? Okay. So I think we're finished here. So this is the last class and we'll leave you to go on in your studies of Bhakti Shastri and we wish you all good luck and we hope everything will go well. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present some of this knowledge with you. Thank you for the association and we wish you all success. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Jai. Jai. Go Jai. back to Vrinda Ki. Jai. Thank you, Mara. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mara. 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 Thank you, M